Well, good afternoon. We'll go ahead and get started here on this uh, uh, Friday in Washington. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Scott Hodge, president of the Tax Foundation. I'd like to welcome all of you uh, to uh, this event this afternoon. Uh, for those of you who don't know the Tax Foundation, we're one of the oldest think tanks in the United States, that, and um, we're unique in that we focus only on the economics of tax policy. And our mission really is to raise the tax IQ of America and Americans, and especially those who uh, make our laws. And so one of the ways that we do that is by hosting forums like this on the uh, main tax issues that are being debated uh, within the tax community. And today we're going to dive into international tax, so, so buckle up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, a few issues are really more complicated than international tax policy, I think, at least for most of us. You know, after all, you know, you've got the interaction of the tax systems from more than 200 jurisdictions across the globe. So start doing the math. 200 jurisdictions times a lot of tax rules and tax provisions for each country, and that adds up to mainly a very complicated and mind-boggling system that'll make your head spin. So if you're a multinational company, each of those jurisdictions is trying to take a piece of your profits. And theoretically, you know, there are rules that have been agreed to over the last hundred years or so to prevent multiple countries from taxing the same dollar or same euro of, of, of profits. Uh, well, if, if only a, if it were that simple. Well, today we're going to delve into a critically important international tax debate that's taking place at the Organization for International Cooperation and Development, the OECD. Now, the OECD has enlisted about 130 countries across the globe um, to uh, debate a new approach for taxing digitalized businesses. And this is very different from the way in which multinational businesses have been taxed over the past 100 years or so. And our panelists are going to go into a little bit greater detail, and let me very, very simplify this, but in its simplest form, this is a debate over where the profits of companies are taxed and who has the right to tax them. And much of the focus of these questions is about companies that are based in one country, uh, but remotely do business in another country and have no physical presence in the country in which their customers are located. So, Imagine this for a minute. You've got a, a company that's headquartered in Silicon Valley. It has a um, subsidiary in Ireland, and that subsidiary in Ireland has a platform that customers in France can use to post pictures of their cats. Now, the company doesn't make profits, and they do that for free. The company doesn't make profits on people posting pictures of their cats. They do it by selling advertising, the advertising that appears next to the pictures of, of cats that are up for free. And someday somebody may actually make a company like this and be kind of, kind of interesting to see that. But as we'll learn, uh, the answer to these questions have serious implications uh, for U.S. businesses and the U.S. economy. And this is what most, should most concern folks that work in this body and in the White House. The implications could be even more serious for the U.S. Treasury and U.S. tax uh, revenues. For example, if the new rules that come out of the OECD give countries with large numbers of users or customers, consumers, so-called market countries, it gives them more authority to tax the profits of foreign com companies then this would mean that more of the profits of U.S. companies would be taxed somewhere else, not here. Now, if more profits of U.S. companies are taxed somewhere else than here, of course, that means that U.S. taxpayers are going to have to make up the difference. As a complicating factor, and perhaps in, in a way, in an odd sort of way, a motivating factor, there are a number of countries that are implementing unilaterally what we call digital services taxes, taxes on digital companies that are located somewhere else. And uh, that means they're mostly taxing U.S. companies or seem to be aimed at them. And uh, of course, that means U.S. taxpayers. So one of the questions that we'll ask our panelists is, if the U.S. agrees to these major changes in the way that multinational companies are taxed, will this agreement mean that 
these other countries will sort of disengage or eliminate these digital services taxes? We don't know. And maybe the biggest question of all is what price will the US have to pay in order to bring some stability to the international tax order? Well, these are some of the nettlesome questions that we're asking our esteemed panelists to answer today. And let me introduce you. Uh, we have a great group today, and I think well, this is going to be a very, very interesting discussion. First up, we'll have Daniel Bunn, uh, Director of Global Projects at the Tax Foundation. And some of you actually may remember Daniel from his days at, uh, here in the U.S. Senate. Uh, we worked for uh, Mike Lee and, and Tim Scott. And then next, we'll have uh, Will Morris uh, to my right, who's PwC's Deputy Global Tax Policy Leader. Uh, Will also chairs the Tax Committee for Business at the OECD, uh, which you, some of you may remember as BIAC, and leads the European Tax Policy Forum. Uh, to my left, Carol, Cor uh, Carol Doran Klein, who is Vice President and International Tax Council at the U.S. Uh, Council for International Business, USCIB. She manages USCIB's Tax Committee and represents the views of its members in front of the U.S. government and, of course, various international uh, forums. And finally, to our far, my far left and your far right, our co-host for this event, uh, Derek T Tyre. Uh, Derek is Vice President for Policy and Business uh, at the Business Roundtable. He is also a veteran here of the Senate, served as Senior Tax Counsel for Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana. So with that, we'll kick it off. Uh, we'll ask Daniel to kick it off and start a very, very interesting conversation about this topic. Thank you very much. Thanks, Scott, and uh, thanks, everybody, for being here today. Uh, so as Scott was mentioning, international economic policy and international tax policy is pretty interesting these days. Uh, but if, you know, if we're not talking about the complexities of implementing guilty or beat, there's plenty of other things to talk about, like right? trade war or Brexit or the French digital services tax or what we're here to talk about today, which is related to what the OECD is doing. And, and like Scott, I'll start off with a bit of an example that could help us think through the way things are currently and the way things might change. So imagine you run a business here in the United States and that business makes cars. Now, you're going to try to sell those cars abroad and you're thinking through different ways you might be able to do that. You may export directly to a market abroad. You may set up a subsidiary, a factory abroad, and then sell from there. Uh, you may figure out a country that's convenient to a lot of customers, then you'd set up a large factory there, and you sell, um, sell from there. Or you have to think through where your distribution network is going to be. And all of these different things in the context of thinking through, oh no, I'm gonna be competing with other car companies that are probably going to be trying to reach the same consumers that I'm trying to reach. And you think through all these different things, even before you get to the policy question, I haven't even mentioned the trade or regulatory or tax policies that might influence some of these decisions. Now, of course, you can't necessarily change where your customers are but you can think through ways that you can set up your, your global supply chain um, in order to minimize uh, the impact of different regulatory measures or different policies. Now, you might consider putting a factory uh, in a lower tax jurisdiction if that's close to your potential consumers, or you may think of uh, different ways to, uh, to look at how different tax systems are set up and be able to use uh, the opportunities for a certain system and, and play that up against another system. And there's all sorts of different ways that you could take advantage of the current differences in rules across countries. And that, that can really impact your after-tax profitability. It can impact your ability to set up new factories, to sell new cars, and the profits that you would be able to give back to your, uh, your, your shareholders. Now, when you're considering setting up a factory in a, new in a new country, you may be thinking, okay, this is going to be a lot of jobs and a lot of investment, and the country's also considering that. You know, there are countries that are thinking, okay, it'd be great to have a new factory with new cars, you know, that we're able to sell and a lot of jobs. You know, how can the country design its tax policies to be able to be attractive to that investment? Now, some jurisdictions have zero corporate tax rates. Well, how does that fit into the picture? Now, it's some, a lot of these jurisdictions with zero corporate tax rates, they're small islands. They may not make sense for a, heavy, a huge factory, 
But let's say there's intellectual property behind the design of your car. Maybe you can locate the intellectual property in a subsidiary in a low-tax jurisdiction and charge royalties for use of the, that intellectual properties to your factories abroad, earning the royalties in the zero-tax jurisdiction and uh, occurring those costs in higher-tax jurisdictions. Now, when you think through all of this, you also, again, have to think through the perspective of countries. Countries may not appreciate the fact that you're putting uh, your intellectual property in a low tax jurisdiction. They may try to create rules to tax that. The U.S. recently adopted guilty to effectively create a formula to tax IP income off that's uh, accrued offshore. Now, think also about a country that might not get a factory or jobs, but your car company sells lots of cars to their citizens. That country may want a slice of tax revenue from your profits, even though you don't have employees or factories there in that country. And those two issues, the issue of minimum taxation on foreign earnings and the issue of whether a country can tax the profits of a business, even if there's not physical presence there, those are the two issues that are being debated currently at the OECD. So let's think through, if a minimum tax makes putting your intellectual property in the Caymans or, or in another you know, low tax jurisdiction no longer worth it, well, where does your IP end up? What does that do to your tax bill? Your car company may have several factories in a few different countries, uh, intellectual property may be in a low tax jurisdiction, and sales to dozens of countries around the world, but no employees or buildings in, in a lot of those countries. Now, if countries where you have sales but no employees or buildings are going to be taxing your profits, that's going to change the way you think about entering into new markets. And it could change your overall tax, tax costs. Uh, let, let's get a little bit closer to what's, uh, what's actually being discussed here. Uh, I have a, a flow chart up on the screen that walks through a, a hypothetical example of a company that has operations in, uh, in one country, perhaps in the U.S., with a 21% corporate tax rate, but sales split 50-50 between the U.S. and another country. Under the current situation, the U.S. would tax all the profits that are, that are generated because all the physical presence, all the factories, everything is in the U.S. But if we're looking at what the OECD is considering, where you're going to take potentially a fraction of a fraction. Now, just for the example, say this is a very profitable car company with 20% profit margin. So just, just leave that, that uh, where it is. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, Yes. Um, and then you're going to be have to taking a fraction of a fraction and giving that to a different jurisdiction. You're going to have to think through, OK, well, how do I file taxes in a jurisdiction where I've never filed taxes? Or what happens if that jurisdiction wants more than its share of my profits based on sales? And as you expand out, Scott mentioned that there's more than 130 countries in this negotiation. But then, you know, think of all the tax jurisdictions in the world this can get really complicated really fast. You're not, you know, there are open questions about when foreign tax credits would apply and things like that. Now, in the example, the tax increase isn't very much. The, new, the other country doesn't get uh, that much of a new taxing right, but you think through uh, the complexity of even paying that small amount of tax in, in multiple countries where you weren't paying tax before. How you coordinate that to make sure that you're not ending up with uh, double taxation is going to be a, a serious puzzle to solve. Now, Carol and, uh, and I believe Will will get a little bit more detail on this, uh, but I just wanted to introduce this as an example. So higher tax costs will impact when, where, how much you as in your car company invest. It, you know, will it mean closing factories abroad? Maybe not, but it could impact where your next factory is going to go. It could impact uh, whether you have another factory in a different country. You may want to protect where your supply chain is right now and just, just try to hold, hold steady until things settle out. Now, I brought the bit about intellectual property into the story because IP is an incredibly important piece to this discussion, mainly because all sorts of businesses, not just the, uh, the social media platform that, that Scott was referring to, but all sorts of businesses rely on highly valuable patents, data, and other sorts of IP for their products. And because you could, in theory, 
Like I mentioned in my example, put your IP potentially anywhere in the world because it's highly mobile, countries want to figure out a way to tax the value from that IP, whether through associated sales or minimum taxes. And for a country like the US, with lots of companies that have really valuable IP, and a lot of that IP located here in the US, these proposals could have serious consequences. The proposals could have consequences for our tax revenue, uh, as Scott mentioned, uh, especially if other countries get to tax more of the profits from US companies. We have, when you think about these highly profitable companies and the types of IP that's generating uh, these, these high profits, we have a, uh, a trade surplus when it comes to royalties of about 72 billion. So if you're thinking about, well, maybe we'd be able to tax more of companies that are exporting to us or uh, you know, offset some of these things, it, it's tough to see how, how it would all pan out. But in some, in, in some ways of thinking about this, the US may be uh, a small or potent, uh, a small net loser when it comes to, com comes to tax revenue when you think of the companies that would be in scope. So with that, laying the groundwork and thinking through why international tax matters and how different countries might impact the way that you would set up your supply chain or whatever as a, as a car manufacturer or even back to Scott's example of a social media platform, I think uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Will to get a little bit more into uh, the details of how, how we got to where we are. Uh, thanks very much, Daniel. Yeah, so I'm the, I'm the history guy today. Um, it's uh, Carol and Derek who will bring you up to the present and peer into the future. Cloudy though it may be. Um, let, let me just ask a level setting question because um, uh, one of the problems with tax people is they talk tax in the end. Um, and that can be confusing. Does, if, if I say BEPS, how many people know what BEPS is? Okay, we do have an informed crowd. Uh, okay, well, I won't spend too much time explaining what BEPS is then. Um, but in terms of understanding the history of, of how we got to, to this point right now with this OECD project, we do have to understand BEPS, and we have to understand what caused uh, the BEPS project as well. For the few who didn't stick your hands up, that's base erosion and profit shifting. It's about shifting income uh, out of jurisdictions, um, both by uh, eroding the base, the taxable base, which can be interest payments, royalty payments, that type of stuff. And it's profit shifting, which essentially is about transfer pricing, um, which again, brought down a level, is how you price the sale of goods and services uh, between related party companies um, in different countries. Uh, and by um, you know, by setting the price high or low, um, obviously you can you can shift um, uh, the, the the profit from one country to another. So that's that's base erosion and profit shifting. Um, the OECD has a relatively long history uh, in this area, um, and they've been worried about certain aspects uh, of profit shifting. Some of the stuff that Daniel was talking about in relation to uh, tax havens, for example, low tax jurisdictions. Um, uh, dates at least from the 90s when there was a project called the Harmful Tax Competition Project. Um, so there have been these concerns around for a while, um, but through the financial crisis, essentially, um, the OECD pretty much tinkered at the edges, tried to smooth things out. Um, they have been well known for many years for that double taxation treaty, model double taxation treaty, um, which is about the avoidance of double taxation, just to be clear. Um, but what happened during the financial crisis, as, as you all know, um, is that a number of things came together. Some of those had occurred, had begun at least before the financial crisis. Others occurred during the financial crisis. Uh, one of the things which had started well before the financial crisis was globalization. Um, so the ability of businesses to do um, much more uh, trade and investment across borders, um, helped by the end of exchange controls, fall of the Iron Curtain, uh, at least until around 2000 WTO agreements. Um, so the ability of businesses to do uh, business on a global basis, but at the same time, the international tax rules not keeping up uh, with that. So there was a lag uh, with the international tax rules. Um, uh, there was also you know, the phenomenon of digitalization, again, about which most of you know probably quite a lot. Um, this was pre-financial crisis, but we've seen it continue to accelerate um, you know, from uh, the 1990s onwards, the OECD originally dealt with this in relation to electronic commerce, which now seems a, a very quaint phrase. Um, but uh, the, you know, they, they came up with something called the Ottawa Accord in the, in the late um, 
uh, 1990s, which essentially said, don't put taxes on this, you know, this brand new thing. Um, uh, allow it to flourish. It'll bring wealth uh, and prosperity to, to, to many countries. And again, through the financial crisis, that was generally accepted. And indeed, uh, if you look back on the past 20 years uh, and what has happened in that space, you think actually that was an amazing amount of foresight. However, um, uh, tax issues have arisen around that. So you have those two things already existing, um, globalization, digitalization. A third factor, which has also been changing throughout this time, um, is the relative decline uh, of the OECD countries, essentially the uh, European uh, and North American economies, and the relative rise of the BRICS in particular, um, who have different concerns in this area. The tax system is... Uh, as Daniel said, was designed, or actually Scott said, was designed 100 years ago, give or take, um, and uh, really favored countries which had lots of capital, which they could export, export uh, into countries uh, to do business there. Um, but then they, the countries from which that capital came wanted to reap the benefits of that under the tax system. So very little, you know, un at least relatively little profit was left uh, in the countries, the so-called source countries at that point, uh, into which that income went. Uh, and much more was taxed in the resident, residence countries, i.e. the countries from which the capital came, uh, and to which the, the profits, dividends, whatever, um, flowed back. Um, so you have those three things coming together. Then in the financial crisis, uh, what you get is, um, obviously, firstly, um, budget austerity in a bunch of countries. You look what we did here. Um, you know, uh, the debt ratchets up again. Uh, there is a need, at least at some level, to fund that. Um, that was the same also in many Western European countries. Some uh, basic services uh, were cut. People got quite mad. Um, and that fed through into the politics. It also led through into a, an increasing mistrust, which, again, was a phenomenon which was occurring, uh, at least in relation to some of these institutions before the financial crisis, but certainly a, a, a growing mistrust, um, not just in government, which was happening before the financial crisis, but particularly in business as well. People no longer believed that business had, um, you know, the workers, consumers, whoever it was, you know, their best interest in heart, that they were really only concerned in feathering their own nest, paying themselves, you know, handsome bonuses and all the rest of that stuff. Uh, put aside the rights and wrongs of that for a second, that very much became the narrative. In that context, planning, which um, clearly had accelerated, in part as a result of globalization and other things, uh, in the 90s and into the 2000s, um, all of a sudden became the subject of, um, to put it politely, adverse um, criticism. Uh, it became, you know, something which had been at the back of the newspaper, somewhere hidden in the financial pages, to something which was pretty much on the front page. And this led to an increasing uh, and um, politically attractive anti-avoidance narrative uh, by politicians. Uh, and the way that, that BAPS turned out... Um, uh, was essentially that there was a pot of gold on the table of, the, of untaxed income, double non-taxation is one of the phrases which came in during BEPS, uh, into which countries essentially could you know, dip their hand, get their fair share, uh, and the only people who would be hurt would be the businesses who hadn't been paying their tax in the first place. Now, you know, again, put, us, put aside exactly how accurate that picture is, and there, you know, there are elements of truth to it. There clearly were some businesses with very, very, very low effective tax rates. There are other businesses who played you know, plenty. Um, but that, again, became, became the narrative. So, so, so BAPS happens. Um, action item number one in BAPS is the taxation of the digital economy. It's, it's a perception that um, some of the digital companies in particular have been able to, um, uh, in part because they can deliver their services or, or you know, they can interact with their consumers um, remotely, and therefore you don't need a physical presence in a country, which is normally what gives you the basis uh, to tax that, so there's the ability to do that. There's the ability with IP, which again, intellectual property, as Daniel was talking about, particularly in these uh, types of, uh, uh, of entities where there is, there is some uh, infrastructure, to be very clear, uh, and they do actually spend, they do have, they have much higher capex than you might think. Um, but nevertheless, um, you know, a, a lot of intellectual property, it's the algorithms, um, which are the basis of the value for these corporations, and those, as Daniel said, um, are clearly much more mobile than a bricks and mortar factory. Um, so this, this is action item number one. Um, in, in order to prevent anything particularly meaningful from happening, um, they form a task force on the digital economy and they make co-chairs, the French and the Americans, um, who are diametrically opposed, essentially, 
Um, so they, they, they fight it to a standstill. The, the French have lots of wacky ideas, which, um, uh, you know, which keep coming back about the value of data, for example. Data's the new oil. That, that was last year's phrase, not this year's phrase. Um, but, you know, the idea that, that data in and of itself is very valuable. Um, anyway, what they did was they came up with a report in 2015 which said, we're not going to ring fence a digital economy, we can't ring, ring fence a digital economy, and that has been the consistent uh, approach, not just of um, the Trump administration over the past few years, but also the Obama administration prior to that. So in, the, in that sense, um, a bipartisan approach. And they said, we'll come back to this in 2020. Well, that clearly wasn't going to work for a bunch of countries um, who were really not very happy about it at all. The UK actually jumped into the middle of this with you know, the first of these so-called unilateral measures. What does unilateral measure mean? Well, uh, sort of in a synonym antonym sense, it means something which isn't multilateral, which is what the OECD process was meant to be in the first place. But you know, one of the things that BEPS did was it, it sort of loosened up the, the definition of what good behavior was. Um, and countries sort of looked around and they said, well, actually, we can probably get away with this. Um, so, so why wouldn't we do it? So the first of those was a diverted profits tax you know, back in 2015. Not solely aimed at digital, but clearly put in place by the UK um, in order to create permanent establishments, the right to tax, in other words, in the UK, um, where there wasn't actually a physical presence. So it had a digital element to it. You then move on from that, we see um, uh, some gross withholding taxes, which is to say uh, a withholding tax on gross payments out, so not net payments, which is what an income tax is meant to be about, but gross payments out um, in specific areas. So the Indians were the first to the table here, as, as they quite often are in this space. Um, and uh, they had a, an equalization tax, um, not really an equalization tax, as I say, it was a gross withholding tax on payments to outside of India, but this was for digital advertising. Um, uh, other countries uh, began to look at other things. In some cases, it was catch up on VAT, um, so, you know, the, the, the Europeans, in fact, almost the rest of the world, uh, has a VAT, which is a, uh, effectively a sales tax. So it's a turnover tax. Um, but it used to be based on where the goods came from rather than where they went to. And the Europeans have now changed that, and so other countries are playing tax, catch up on that. But then, uh, into this situation in 2017, um, the OECD, uh, sorry, the G20, um, when the new administration's attention was elsewhere, said, hey, we should come back to this quicker. So let's, let's do a report by 2018. The moment that happens, the European Commission, which um, has a competitive relationship with the OECD, let's put it like that, um, felt that they also needed to do something. So they came up within the next year with two pieces of draft legislation. One is a so-called significant digital presence, um, which is effectively a digital PE, which takes the standard down from physical presence what used to be contract inclusion now at least requires people in the country doing quite a lot to effectively revenue. You, you, you get revenue there, um, you know, you, you do it. Now, admittedly, that's what the states do and have done for a while in this country. Uh, and the sales tax aspect was obviously what was covered by wafer. Um, but uh, the, there was also the digital services tax, which was their short term uh, part of this. And this is, a, again, a turnover tax, not a VAT. They're very careful to say that. But it's a turnover tax on certain types of revenue arising from the provision of certain digital services. Um, and what they looked at in particular was um, uh, income arising from uh, digital, ad digital advertising revenue uh, arising from information which social media websites got through the way that platform worked. So that's point one. It was, it was very targeted. And in fact, very helpful in an early draft, they actually named the American companies they were thinking of in the draft in parentheses. They cleaned that up by the time it went public. It was a bit late by the time. Um, the, the second thing is uh, the services from uh, marketplaces, so things like Amazon Marketplace. Not the actual sale of the goods uh, and services which take place over that, but the fees which Amazon charge for the maintenance uh, of the marketplace, so what they call multi-sided business models. But again, very specifically carved out financial services. They didn't want to create too much trouble. And then the last part was the sale of data. Um, so data, again, collected by social media websites, which then gets packaged up. Uh, and sold on to others to use for market research, advertising, focusing, whatever, whatever it is. Um, so I think I probably slightly overstayed my welcome, um, but I think that pretty much brings us up to uh, to the beginning of this year, and that means it's time for Carol. Thank you very much. Welcome, Carol. Well, the advantage of not being able to be wrong, since I'm just talking about what might happen. Um, 
Um, and, and I also wanted to um, start my, I, I think it's always good to try to make people laugh a little. And when you were talking, Will, I thought you were talking uh, for a minute about goats and services. And I thought, <laughs> goats and services? Well, that's an interesting way to, to think about this. Um, it would be a little bit easier, probably. It's a funny accent. I can't help it. <laughs> if we were talking goats and services. Um, what the OECD has done, um, I'm going to skip over a little bit of uh, earlier this year because there was uh, there was a, a paper that was issued in, in, in March, and but we're past that now. We're at what the OECD is calling the unified approach. Uh, and, and let's go to the first slide here. Um, and, and the unified approach has two pillars. I'm going to cover these at very high levels because covering them in detail would require uh, the whole hour. Um, but, but the unified approach, uh, a pillar one of the unified approach has three pieces and it's really not very unified. Uh, the first piece is just a made up number. That's actually the best way to think about it. It's, it's we're going to start with global profit. We're going to figure um, a, a deemed routine return. We're going to subtract that from the global profit. And then we're going to take a piece of that residual profit, and we're going to allocate it to the market jurisdiction. And so it's just, it's just, a, it's just a, 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 a made up number to satisfy the market jurisdictions is, is basically what it is. Um, and there has been, and this is actually a very hard thing to understand. They are still arguing about the tax policy rationale. And Will didn't really go into this, but, but they're, when they're talking about what we should do, there are basically three different views. One, kind of the UK view of the world, is what we're really trying to get at is user participation. We are trying to tax the value that is added by our consumers in the marketplace. And that's a new thing, and it doesn't relate to anything else. And then the US view as well, no, that's too narrow. If we're going to say the customers add value, they add value all the time. You know, it's, I saw Coca-Cola back there. You know, that's a valuable uh, intangible that is valuable because people want to drink Coca-Cola. Uh, and so it's not just these user participations that are valuable, it's other marketing intangibles. And so this, and then there's a third option, which is um, the, the developing countries have been advocating, which relates to what is called a significant economic presence. And that's basically, we're going to give up on all this, and we're just going to use formulas to determine the income that is taxable in different jurisdictions. And so with respect to this amount A, they still haven't made up their mind what they're trying to do. And, and <laughs> well, it's true. It's true. They still haven't made up their mind. And so it's very difficult to analyze it because whenever you're trying to analyze a tax policy, you say, well, what are you trying to achieve? And if you don't know that, then you don't know whether what you're trying to achieve works. So, so we have this amount A, which is kind of out there, and it might be any of these things. I think it, it makes the most sense to think about it as representing a marketing intangible because it isn't limited to user participation. And therefore, the only thing that makes any sense, and it is trying to define uh, uh, a, an amount that goes to the market. So I, I'm thinking of it along those lines, but it's not clear that that's what it is. Then amount B is a fixed return for actual marketing and distribution functions which take place in a marketplace. And this has, I think, a couple of purposes. One is, despite the fact that this is generally a routine function, taxpayers and, and tax authorities fight about this all the time. And so the idea is to stop the fighting. You know, let's just have a number. It's probably a little bit bigger than what the countries would get uh, if you continued fighting about it under the arm's length standard. But let's just have a fixed number. And then the third thing is, <laughs> And this, you know, I was reading this and I was just kind of scratching my head is, let's use traditional arm's length pricing. You know, so they really haven't gotten rid of traditional arm's length pricing. And what's supposed to be in amount C is if you do more than just the routine marketing return. So if you're doing something, some additional marketing functions which are non-routine, or you built that factory. 
you know, so that you've got your factory there. Then you go back to your regular transfer pricing and you can get your bigger amount C. And um, we're still on our first slide. The, 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 an important thing to remember is this new amount A re applies regardless of whether you have a physical presence in the marketplace. Uh, they are going to be arguing about what you have to have in the marketplace, but you don't have to have people, you don't have to have assets. You, you probably are going to have to have a certain level of sales, but what that level is is undefined. Um, and, and, you know, there may be other things. There may be temporal limits or, um, you know, other uh, activities so that you would look at somehow at users in, in some senses. Um, now, amounts B and C are, are routine returns or the regular transfer pricing would continue to require either a permanent establishment, so you've got people and assets in that jurisdiction, or you would have a local affiliate, so that you would be having a, a, a price determined under the traditional arm's length standards. Next slide, please. OK. So how does this all intersect with US tax policy? The first thing, and, and, and Will and Daniel have talked about this, is the impact assessment. I mean, if I'm the US and I'm deciding whether I'm going to sign on to this uh, agreement, I have to know what it's going to cost me. And, and, and because everything at this point is so fuzzy, it's really hard to know what the costs are going to be. And, and I think, uh, you know, I, I think and I'm not an economist, so I don't have a real opinion about this, but, but what people have told me is that the US is likely to be a, a net loser, uh, perhaps not a significant net loser, but that depends on the scope and how the numbers and all of these things that are not yet determined play out. So pillar one creates a new taxing right. Um, and for those of you who uh, went to law school and learned that taxing bills have to originate in the House of Representatives <laughs> if you're going to exercise that taxing right. So the U.S. is probably going to be a net loser, but we're also assuming that we are going to tax some things that we don't currently tax. So one of the things that Congress would have to do is they would have to adapt, adopt a new law that says you can tax people who meet these nexus requirements on these amounts determined under amount A in pillar one. You would have to do that. If you didn't do that, you wouldn't be able to tax it, uh, regardless of what the OECD or any multinational treaty uh, says. Pillar one also allows um, countries to impose, other countries to impose tax on US taxpayers. And one of the reasons we've been fighting about this over at the OECD is because the limitation of requiring a permanent establishment or the limitation of requiring um, you know, a, an affiliate that you have this arm's length transaction with, those are treaty obligations. And so if, if we're going to, to, to change the rules and we're now gonna create this ability to tax even though you don't meet those requirements, you need to change the treaties. And, and there's a bunch of things in the treaties that would need to change. And, you know, I, <laughs> I mean, I don't know whether this will ever happen because what the OECD is talking about, and I think the only practical way to do this is a genuine multilateral treaty that looks like the WTO except on taxes. And, and the appetite for something like that in the US Senate might be close to zero. Um, but, but assuming that you got past that political problem, you would have to have a treaty that has a new article that defines the nexus. What is the level of revenue and, and, or, or time or whatever the, the standard is? What's that, what's that new nexus? You would have to put in the treaty the definitions of the allocable income. And then you would also have to have a new article on relief of double taxation because None of this works with the existing concepts of double taxation, and you also would need a new article on dispute resolution. So you have this separate treaty that you would need to implement you know, the relief uh, or the other country's ability to tax our US companies, so 
you know, uh, if I had a social media company that was based in the U.S. And, and the U.K. wants to tax it, you would need to modify all these rules in a treaty that the Senate would approve. Um, so that's kind of, you know, what you would have to do on Pillar 1. Okay. Pillar 2. Um, next slide. Um, Will has talked a little bit about all the various BEPS changes that were made uh, to align uh, taxation with value creation. Uh, and in spite of that, uh, there are countries who still are unhappy and they want to solve the remaining BEPS challenges with a minimum tax. Um, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the details of the minimum tax in a minute. Uh, but, but the there is concern that if you don't solve this, you're going to have a race to the bottom, and therefore you need to have this minimum tax in place. And I think the best way for a U.S. audience to think about this is there are there are there are two pieces of the minimum tax. One is a um, CFC type of rule, and the other is a uh, tax on payments that are going outbound. So think guilty and think beat. I mean, that's, that, that I think is the best way for a U.S. audience to understand what the minimum tax regime is about. Uh, next slide, please. And, you know, uh, we will all breathe an enormous sigh of relief, at least on the business side, if bullet number one is true. And that is, if guilty complies with the OECD design principles, then U.S. companies might have to do, not have to do much of anything because they're already complying with guilty. But that is a very big if. Um, and I think um, there are a bunch of structural rules uh, and design rules, uh, the first one of which is which comes first. Does the CFC come first or does the you know, tax, the under tax payment rule come first? So does guilty come first or does beat come first? If guilty comes first, then, and the rule is, or if the CFC rule comes first, and if the rule is the ultimate parent has a good compliant regime, guilty is a good compliant regime, you don't have to worry about the under tax payment rule. If all of those things are true, then you're, you're probably good. But we have no idea whether <laughs> And, and, and Will is not optimistic about uh, guilty being a, a good tax regime. But um, so, um, and the, the under tax payments rule is actually, and, and a lot of this you have to understand it, it, between the politics and in, in the politics of the inclusive framework where um, the, there's 134 countries, most of them are small and most of them don't have sophisticated tax systems. And many of those want the uh, under tax payment rule to have priority because they want to just impose an additional withholding tax on a royalty or an interest payment or whatever going out of their country. So I, I, I think, you know, countries, you know, the, the, the US, Germany, UK, you know, the OECD secretariat probably wants the CFC rule to come first. But there's going to be a lot of pressure from the, the, the smaller countries that the under tax payment rule should come first. So that's you know a, a very important structural decision which hasn't been decided. Um, we don't know how the tax base will be defined. Uh, I, I sort of thought I mean people have been talking about about using consolidated financials on pillar one, and I thought oh well they'll use consolidated financials. On pillar two, no, no, that's not what I'm hearing. On pillar two, they're talking about trying to define taxable income in some fashion. They haven't agreed on what the minimum tax rate would be, and they don't know how foreign tax, uh, foreign uh, double taxation would be relieved. And th those are all key questions. And and I think one of the reasons that there's skepticism that guilty is going to be a good system is that a lot of the people are advocating for, for essentially a per country um, limitation on foreign tax credits, which of course guilty does not have. So if, if you went to per country, then guilty probably fails, um, unless somebody just says we need the US and therefore we're gonna, just gonna say guilty is okay. 
Okay, and I think my last slide is timing. Um, and th there, there is a paper out on this uh, pillar one that we're going to be providing comments on in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. Um, and then there's supposed to be another paper on pillar two that will be released sometime in, in uh, November, and comments will be due shortly thereafter, and a, and a uh, consultation will be held on, well, the consultation will be held on pillar one in late November and probably mid-December for a consultation on pillar two. And um, USCIB is engaging on all those issues. The OECD wants to have a political agreement by January of next year. Now, they've been saying that for a while, um, and one of the rules of the OECD in the last five, six years is we always meet our deadlines. So somebody is going to say there is a political agreement in January. Is that, that will in all likelihood happen. That doesn't mean that it's a detailed political agreement because they're now talking about, oh, well, we're going to have the architecture in January and then we will have a more detailed political agreement in June, by June of next year, and then we'll do implementation in the next six months. Um, that's a really aggressive time scale uh, when they haven't yet decided what their tax policy rationale is, and so many of these structural issues are going to depend upon the tax policy rationale. So um, anyway, I might have run over. <laughs> All right, we'll ask uh, Derek to take us home. Thanks, Scott. It's good to see some former colleagues, a few of our good member companies. Maybe I'll start just a word on who the Business Roundtable is, and that may help you understand why we would care about what's happening at the OECD. The Business Roundtable is an association of CEOs of almost 200 companies, large multinationals, most of which are based here in the US, as we think about what's happening at global tax space, some of our members are direct targets of digital taxes. They're named in either the legislation or the justification for the legislation. Uh, many of our companies are not necessarily targets of a digital tax. However, as we've all learned, it's 2019. Digital means a lot of different things. And when we think about collection of data and what companies do with data, all of a sudden we're talking about basically every multinational. So any large company is, is going to leverage data, is going to work on digital platforms. And so the scope of a digital services tax, which we've talked about, is, is a big question. Our CEOs uh, at the Business Roundtable tend to focus, and our advocacy is focused on macro issues, right? What, where is our common interest? What are the CEO level concerns? And what's happening at the OECD is now a CEO level concern. Why? Number one, could undermine cross-border investment. Daniel's example laid out, there could be significant disruptions. And the reason is, we're talking about changing long-standing international tax rules. Currently, it, we, we all know there's no perfect tax system, and there's plenty of disagreement today in the international tax system. What the OECD is contemplating, what some countries are pushing, are dramatic, fundamental changes to cross-border taxation. So this is what gets CEO's antenna up. All of a sudden, are we going to pay tax in multiple places? Are we going to have more disputes? Are we going to be arguing with, with auditors and tax authorities throughout the world on some new tax? This is why the CEOs care. So last month, this, uh, a group of our CEOs hosted Pascal Cinnamon, who is the head of the OECD Tax Center. He was here in Washington, had a great discussion, and he previewed what, what Carol laid out for the, the Pillar 1 proposal that OECD has released. We, we really very much appreciate OECD's engagement with the business community. Uh, it, it really, in this case, because we're talking about, again, fundamental changes, we're talking about administration of a new tax, it, it's paramount that we have this engagement, that policymakers understand the effects of these choices that, that they might make. Um, maybe I'll start with pillar two. Carol laid out Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. I'll start with Pillar 2 because the story is pretty short from our perspective. Guilty has to be on a whitelist. It's got to be an acceptable minimum tax. We have a minimum tax. We have a CFC minimum tax in the U.S. 
for it for a company that is subject to guilty, that should be the end of the discussion. There should be no guilty plus some other base erosion tax. Guilty is is should be the final line for for those those companies and payments made to those companies. Now, Carol mentioned also that there is momentum behind a per country approach. That's fine. Other countries may decide to pursue a, a, a per country minimum tax, but it will need to coexist with guilty. Um, we recognize guilty is not perfect. We, we've seen some, some difficulties in implement, implementation. It's not to say guilty could not be improved, but it, it's really just a non-starter to, to require the US to make guilty a, a country by country rule. Okay, pillar two out of the way. Pillar one, I'm glad we had pizza because this is what we're talking about, all right? When you think of pillar one, think pizza. There is a global pie of profit. A, a, com a company will earn profits worldwide. The question under pillar one is, who gets to tax that profit? What size, what size of slice does each country get? That's pillar one. Now, Carol laid out some of the, the nuances of, of what's been proposed. Uh, I'll walk through just, just briefly what we see in the current proposal on pillar one. Uh, really the good, the bad, and the ugly, all right. So the good. Um, the document that uh, the OECD released affirms that preventing double taxation is a key tenet of the project, all right. So that, in our view, is good. End of list for good, all right. Um, I think there's real risk for U.S. businesses and workers in this pro in this OECD project. There's a potential for instability across global tax authorities. Um, we could see lower overall investment and growth, which is to no one's interest. And finally, we continue to see a lack of a clear justification, a rationale for, for what we're doing. As Carol mentioned, we're not even agreed on what we're trying to target with Pillar 1. There, there's really no either economic, structural, design alignment on what are we trying to do. And I, I think in a post-BEPS world, in a world in the US where you have a new tax code, I think this is a, a key concern for US business they look to, to invest worldwide. Okay, the bad. Uh, dispute resolution is a big piece of this. Again, think about pizza, right? Companies are gonna claim a slice of pie. At some point, we know those slices will, will overlap. Country A and country B will claim the same slice, the same portion. What do you do, right? Double taxation, again, is, is a principle here that we're trying to, to maintain, uh, avoiding double taxation. So there needs to be some sort of mechanism to resolve that, to decide whose, you know, whose piece uh, is, is that, uh, who, who, to whom does that piece in question belong? So dispute resolution, we see no real progress thus far at the OECD as far as what dispute resolution will look like uh, under pillar one. Um, in addition, Nexus, this right to tax permanent establishment, we are glad to see that the OECD said that it should be a standalone rule. What we've recognized as we think about what this means, today, Nexus, permanent establishment, right to tax is based on a physical presence. So you, you know, a, a company knows the countries in which it operates because it has people, it has equipment, it has things on the ground in that country. When that's removed, now we have a question about how far does that connection to a country extend? So we have mere sales into a country. Great, so now there may be some pillar one tax. Do, do you now have VAT liability in that country? Is that a, a permanent establishment for VAT purposes? How about non-tax? Uh, are you subject to regulations, corporate governance, environmental, other regulations? Are you subject to courts? You know, rule of law in that country if you have mere sales and no, no physical presence? I mean, these are questions that are important, again, that will affect cross-border investment that are remain very much unaddressed. It creates real risk of uncertainty and, uh, and difficult results for, again, companies and workers. More ugly, the, the proposal says nothing about preemption, abandonment, repeal of other unilateral measures. So we know there's been digital services taxes proposed, even implemented now in France, at least passed theirs. The Brits are still in line to, to approve one. We've seen 
dozens now of other countries at least think about it. Nothing in the document says that those unilateral measures will be preempted, right? That's, that's a real shortcoming here because you want to talk about chaos in the international tax system, that's the current rules overlaying a new OECD framework in addition to a patchwork of digital taxes. That is, is not a recipe for uh, stable growth across, across the globe. A uh, couple more points. Withholding taxes, in our view, are not an appropriate mechanism. We don't need to go into details there, but that was sort of float in the document. Not a good idea. And then finally, with uh, to Carol's last slide, the compressed timeline. This is one that we have to get right. Nominal deadlines, political expediencies should not drive the solution here. This is potential big changes, and we need to get it right. So finally, for those of you who are tax LAs, think, OK, this is great information. Now what do I do with it? So uh, two things. One, find your voice. So you've heard the concerns. Think about what your concerns are, what your boss's concerns are with what's happening at the OECD. Is it you know, digital services taxes targeting US companies, the trade angle? Is it uh, the effect on US businesses and workers? Is it potential loss, as Carol mentioned, potential loss of US revenue, that the US ends up a net loser? So overall, tax receipts in the US are down? So where, where, what, are your what are your key concerns, right? And then use that voice, right? Engage with Treasury, talk with the business community, help create a unified position here in the US so we can advocate for, again, sound tax policy as we move forward with the OECD project. So if you want to reach out to me, Carol and Will are true experts on this stuff, please do so. Uh, again, this is one that we need to get right. Great. Well, thank you very much, Derek, and thank you to all of you. Uh, now it's uh, Q&A, and I want to get to your Q&A, because many of you probably have questions that your boss is probably asking you and so forth. But let me just kind of start things out. And I do want to tease out this notion of uh, the impact both on either the revenues or, 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 or corporate behavior of these different elements because they obviously will affect companies and revenues in very, very different ways. And in many respects, we are, it does seem like we're in a little bit of a prisoner's dilemma here. Uh, both for, from a, a, a country standpoint because we don't necessarily know how we're going to be impacted. Other countries don't necessarily understand how they're going to be, or maybe they do, but they don't understand how the other guys are. So we don't know whether we're to cooperate or to go on our own. And, and uh, so this is, this is a bit of a dilemma. But let's try to tease this out if we could, and maybe just one at a time. Looking at the different elements of pillar one, changing taxing rights. Uh, toward market countries. How is that going to affect behavior? How is it going to affect economics or revenues? Minimum tax, how does that affect behavior? And how might that affect either revenues or economics? And then we can just start with Daniel and just kind of work our way down quickly uh, from each of you. Sure. So just real quickly on, on pillar one, the, the key question is what it will do for uh, tax compliance and potential double taxation. Uh, there's certainly going to be a lot of headaches associated with coordinating anything that looks um, like this proposal uh, and being able to comply with it and knowing where you're supposed to pay tax and that that is the right amount to pay tax there or not too much in other places. That's, that's a really complicated uh, problem. So a lot on tax compliance um, on pillar one and uh, you know minimizing tax disputes because of the tax disputes themselves are a huge compliance cost um, and part of the, the cost of you know paying tax in multiple jurisdictions. On pillar two, it's uh, more of a question of how the economics of existing anti-base erosion policies have worked out and how that's impacted business behavior and whether the new minimum tax would have similar effects where you see, you know, when the rules apply, businesses figuring out where to invest, as I was describing in my example, where to change their supply chain, or if they're going to be below or above the threshold, how they stay safe in, you know, in a, in a, in a carve out or, or, or things like that. Um, and we haven't really talked about whether there's going to be a different segmentation of the market and what all these different thresholds and definitions mean for businesses that have, you know, 
multiple lines of business and different effective tax rates for different lines of business and what what the rules would apply to. And um, it's it'll be a, a complex problem that will, again, uh, get to uh, profitability and investment behavior, real investment behavior, not just the shifting of where IP is located. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I mean, there's a there's an English phrase which some of you may know about um, not buying a pig in a poke. You have to understand a poke is a bag. Um, you wouldn't buy a pig that you haven't seen, and there is an element to, of that to, to this whole project. Uh, and goes back in part to what Carol was saying about you know, uh, we've decided what the answer is, now we just have to figure out what the theory is. Um, uh, but we also have to do decide, try to figure out how much it costs. And early on in this project, early on in this project, earlier this year, um, a number of countries are very worried about uh, what Pillar 1 um, would, uh, would do to them because this is about reallocating income. And almost by definition, um, at least in this case, if, if, if one country wins, another country has to lose. Has to lose. So, so what's going to happen? Well, they've, they've sorted part of that out by saying, well... Under pillar two, everybody will do great, so, um, so don't worry about that. But at least in relation to, uh, to the US, um, what uh, Treasury has been saying so far is, uh, I mean, as Carol said, it might be a slight loss, it might be a slight win, but it's pretty much a wash. Now, you, you sort of dig into that just a little bit, um, and it's a wash because the US FISC might do just fine, um, because the US is a large market, and therefore when you, you know, the more stuff you sell into the US, the more you're going to get under amount A and maybe B and C as well. Um, uh, but actually, uh, U.S. exporting businesses um, would do a whole lot less well out of this, um, but at least potentially. And you know, Daniel's example is a very mild one of the reallocation. It could be first in that. But the, the true answer is we don't know. Um, and yet the politics of this is barreling, barreling along so fast um, that uh, it's very hard to tell. Some of you may have seen the, uh, the OECD sort of does a webcast from time to time that they call tax talks. And on the last one, when they rolled this paper out, they, they put an economist on the panel. Um, I would not have wished to have been that economist. Um, uh, but she ended up saying three things, which may not, uh, which are, well, maybe they're as unified as unified approaches. Um, but she said three things. She said, firstly, um, countries are going to do very well out of both pillar one and pillar two. Point number two is this is going to have no impact on investment at all. Uh, and, point number th and point number three uh, is that this won't affect the effective tax rates of corporations. And you think, well, there's something which isn't quite adding up there. Um, so, you know, I think that we do need to think very strongly, very hard about what the revenue impacts of this are, because in the end, the question that you and your bosses are going to have to answer is, is this good for the United States? Um, not is this good for the world? Uh, is this good for global welfare? But is this good for the United States? And that answer is pretty cloudy. Uh, right at the moment, and whether it's pillar one, um, uh, you know, where there are, there are clashes, to be sure, um, between, you know, amount A, amount B, and amount C, or whether it's pillar two, and what I'm a little less sanguine about, you know, even if guilty is whitelisted, um, exactly what does that mean, depending on the balance between the two elements of that. Yet there are so many puts and takes here that to rush this forward without understanding what the impacts are going to be uh, on you know, for the United States, I think would be a mistake. Well, I'm going to look at this from a slightly different perspective. I think that um, we need to think about country behavior uh, because the particularly Pillar 2 could very well influence country behavior. If they use a per country uh, limitation and the minimum rate is 15%, I cannot imagine why a country wouldn't raise its corporate tax rate to 15%. I, I mean, I, people have told me, oh, no, they won't do that. And I think, why? I, I mean, you know, it, you, you either do it or, you know, the U.S. gets it or Germany gets it or some other country is going to top it up to that 15%. And so I, I think there's a... and, and and to the extent that we still have a foreign tax credit system, that's an impact, a potential impact on the U.S. tax base because, you know, all of a sudden, um, you know, you've got more taxes in U.S. subsidiaries of U.S. companies that we haven't eliminated uh, foreign tax credits entirely. And so, so that's one thing. And 
I, I mean, I, and, I, and company behavior, um, it's hard to know. I mean, I, you know, if I look at A, B, and C, and I think, oh gosh, you know, what am I gonna do? I've got all these potential overlaps and nobody's really told me how they work out. And, and I actually think there might be like, um, a, and I don't think that the OECD wants this or that the countries probably want this, but I think there might be a pressure to centralize because you say, oh, okay, I'm gonna to have to pay this amount A regardless, but if I, if I don't have that PE or if I don't have that affiliate, I don't have to pay amounts B and C. And so, you know, I look at that and I say, well, I, at least, you know, if A is certain, if they actually manage to define A, which they're talking about, they wanna achieve upfront certainty and, and have some kind of, you know, they know the size of the pie and they know what everybody slices then you're done, you know, and I don't have B and C. And so obviously taxes isn't the only thing that drives investment. You know, people make lots of decisions about where they're going to put things. But on the margins, you might say, oh, I don't want to be there because I'll have to worry about B and C and dispute resolution and all the overlaps. And, you know, so I could have a significant impact on where I decide to put some people and some businesses. Um, you know, but I don't know. I mean, because we don't know what the rules are yet. I mean, <laughs> flying blind. Yeah. Just a couple quick points. I think uh, having worked in project finance in the past, I think the prospect of paying tax twice is one of the biggest things that will will stop an investment in its tracks. Uh, your your project economics become pretty difficult if it looks like you're going to be paying tax in two different places. Uh, and on minimum taxes. For a long time, the U.S. has had rules, international tax rules, to which no other country, to which con companies in no other country are subject. And that creates a competitive disadvantage. So it's one of the challenges with guilty today is does that burden U.S. investment overseas versus companies operating out of other countries? And if we're talking about a guilty plus for U.S. companies, that, that will definitely make them far less competitive as they compete with foreign-based companies for, for projects outside the U.S. So if you were at the Treasury, how would you play this? Um, I, I'm going to throw you a real curveball here. What is the best option? What is the best tactic? Um, what is the best outcome? And then what potentially could be the worst? based on how the, the chips fall here. Um, I know that's, that's tough. No one can imagine. No one would probably want to be chip harder right now. Um, but how, how might you play this? And again, you know, what, what would be the best option for the U.S. position, and what would be the worst? Yeah, I was going to say, I'd, I'd try to find a different portfolio to work on. That's what I'd do if I was at Treasury. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really tough. I, I think... We've heard from the OECD, from other countries, some skepticism about the U.S.'s interest and ability to participate in multilateral discussions, just in the, the current environment. And so that, that's a challenge. And I think uh, Treasury has, has done a good job of engaging, not sitting this one out, engaging with the OECD, with, with other countries, uh, engaging with U.S. business. Treasury's been, been fairly open in requesting input and you know again the OECD has requested that business input but this is a tough challenge for policymakers to, to find and I think it, it becomes nearly impossible when we're talking about a year-end 2020 full implementation so I think it would be our hope that whatever is agreed to uh, is does, does not create terrible disparate results and that again we can take the time to to get these rules right. Um, so I think one thing to remember is that the, so the U.S. has clearly engaged in this process and in many senses, at least in the early stages, drove it um, with the so-called marketing intangibles approach, which came out earlier this year. Um, and that is a, uh, there is always the danger, of course, that we fight the last war. And what 
Chip and this Treasury were doing was responding very much to the perception of what had happened during BEPS, which is that the US had, for the most part, stepped aside from the BEPS proposal. They'd been uh, lulled, I suppose, into a, a sense of maybe false security. You know, don't worry about this. If everybody else agrees to it and you don't like it, you don't have to do it, you can reserve on it in treaties, you know, you won't have to implement it. Well, actually, it turns out these days, if the rest of the world does something, that's a big deal um, for both for the US and particularly for US business doing, uh, doing businesses. So, so Chip very much decided to, um, uh, to engage in this, and I think that was an appropriate thing to do. Um, I think we're, we're sort of, I don't know whether we're getting towards the end game or maybe there are a series of end games. Um, but, but this is the point uh, in these types of international agreements where um, the momentum becomes your enemy as opposed to your friend. And what you see with these G20 communiques is each time they ratchet up, you know, well, your Treasury Secretary agreed to it. So how can you step back from it? Um, so I think this is a point at which to continue to engage, because if we pulled out at this stage, I have no doubt that the process would now continue, and it would continue in a way which would turn out even worse for U.S. business. There would clearly be no guilty exception. Um, there would be, um, you know, nothing else which would be to the U.S. advantages. So the U.S. has to stay involved. I think the U.S probably has to be quite robust, however, uh, in its discussions. Uh, and as I said, so therefore coming back to, you know, what is the interest of the US uh, in this? Because I can promise you um, for a certainty that other countries are pursuing their own self-interest uh, in this process. This is not a sort of um, global good government exercise. Uh, this is a what's our relative advantage in this process. Pascal has said uh, on multiple occasions that, that um, the deal is what countries can agree on. And, and, and the U.S. is essential to this. We are still the world's largest economy, and you cannot rewrite the international tax rules without the U.S. being engaged. And the U.S., it, they, 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 they don't have as much power as they did when Will and I were in Treasury, but they, they still have a fair amount of power, and and you know I, I like to think of that scene from the, the Wizard of Oz where you know this must be done delicately. You know you 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 can you you do need to to advocate for both the U.S. government and for U.S. businesses, but you can't go in and be a bully. I mean they 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 have to be willing to take into account the the issues of other people and. And and it might very well be that you know that the guilty on a white list is is a is a is a must have. I mean, you know that everybody probably has you know some must haves. And how many of them can you have? And how many of them are you you're going to ultimately probably have to give up something? You know, even if it's on your must have list. But but it is a very political process. But the U.S. has a lot of political power, and they just have to be. You know, they have to be kind of like, you know, delicately exercising that political power. I want to make sure you have time before we uh, run out of time. Anyone have any questions? Please step forward, wave your hand. Uh, any last thoughts, uh, Daniel, as we wrap up? So I, I'd like to hit um, on a point that, that Derek raised um, in the in the context of uh, Carol's um, remarks about the U.S. remaining engaged and uh, using um, whatever leverage we have. Um, I think it would be very uh, dissatisfying uh, if we get to this point next year and uh, the unilateral measures are still outside the context of whatever is being negotiated uh, and. You know, we, as, uh, as has been mentioned, there, there are multiple countries uh, right now that are, are pursuing uh, digital services taxes, the first payments under the French digital services tax uh, is due next month. And the complexities with those taxes on, on themselves, this is, this is essentially these, um, these countries looking at the, at the pie and, and um, you know, uh, grabbing at the U.S. Uh, tax base without, uh, you know, kind of a multilateral solution. Um, so I think bringing that back into the context of this discussion and working through what sort of agreement can be had and then whether where that agreement contradicts uh, unilateral or domestic policies um, for those to be uh, preempted, as, as Derek was saying. So 
this is an enormously complex project. Um, but that is probably the understatement of, uh, uh, of the year. Um, I mean, we are talking about reshaping the international tax system, uh, and none of this stuff is easy. And I come back to my original point, which is that rushing this is not a good idea. I mean, one of the things that we have not talked about um, are you know, some of the details about how you do this. One of the things which came up in the paper was trying to draw a distinction between consumer-facing and non-consumer-facing. What does that mean? Are we going to draw a line from the top of the map to the bottom? How are we going to do this? How are we going to figure it out? How are countries going to get agreement? And, you know, again, there, there is a, a danger that um, with the timetable being the way it is, that we're driven towards first an architecture uh, and then a quote-unquote agreement, um, which actually sketches out very few of these details. And I think that one of the things that we need to do is to continue to pay attention to that aspect of it as well. Scott, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Uh, I have a couple of different things you've been saying here. And not only here, elsewhere about this thing. But I was really curious what the chat's thoughts. As Derek says in the OECD paper, says, this is supposed to be a very limited project. It's supposed to be the arms length standard works in the vast majority of cases. It needs to be a very limited project. It should hit very few people. As Wilde said, we're talking about remaking doesn't sound very much like a limited project to me. That sounds, and um, I've also heard other countries speak about this and talk about how we have to limit the carve outs and we have to limit the exceptions because we need as broad a base as possible. So as you hear folks talk about it and read, it seems a little inconsistent. So I'm interested in everyone's thoughts about whether this is a limited project or this is a broad scope project. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, a, it's a great point, a good question. I think it's, it's really the risk of it becoming uh, a fundamental rewrite. This is decoupling, right? This is unhitching the boat from the dock and just trying out new rules. Like, let's see how this goes. We don't really know what's going on in post-BEPS. We don't know what's happening post-US tax reform. Let's put in some new rules and just roll the dice. I, mean, I think that's the real risk, is we step away from the arm's length standard we step away from a principle-based system, that is what we're talking about. That's what I'm talking about when I say a fundamental rewrite. I'll give you a shake your head at this point. <laughs> I think one of, the, one of the dangers that we have here is the fact that there has been this very broad, um, abstract discussion. I mean, the lack, that's been the reoccurring theme here is the lack of specificity. And also what disturbs me is the lack of uh, impact assessment and economic analysis, which was supposed to be part of their, the OECD's mandate in this. And what we've learned is that, uh, well, and they've already done it, release the proposal first, and then at some point down the way, we're going to get the impact assessment and economic analysis. Um, and we've asked if that will be done quickly, and apparently it's at least December, if not afterward. And for those of us in, in this body in particular, who are used to getting scores when you're getting, you know, reviewing legislation, uh, this is kind of a, a cart before the horse sort of exercise where we're going to debate the issue and then learn how it's going to impact the economy and revenues and, and et cetera uh, later on. And maybe that's what's creating some of the, pre the prisoner's dilemma element of it. But it's also very disturbing. And one of the reasons why Daniel and I have been so adamant with the OECD to produce economic anal analysis and impact assessment so that we really understand the impact of this. It's very difficult from the outside, but we do know, based on the data, as Daniel mentioned, the U.S., and when it, term when it comes to, in, uh, to IP, has a, uh, 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 a surplus with the rest of the world of about $72 billion last year. Also, the, uh, the, um, uh, the IMF uh, released a report earlier this year illustrating or showing that when it comes to uh, residual profits, the U.S. is the leader there once again. Based on your definition of what residual or what constitutes residual profits, we have as much as 50% of the world's residual profits. So it's not hard to imagine how the U.S. will be a net loser in this um, uh, at the end of the day. So these are all questions that we want answers to. It will be interesting to see that how this unfolds. But I want to thank the panelists. Uh, for their insights today, and uh, uh, we will continue to track this and uh, look forward to 
obviously uh, another uh, or future panels like this as these details come out. So thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Look forward to seeing you again.